But what a data center ultimately does, it underpins the ability for companies, organizations, for society as a whole to deploy technology. And all that technology has to go into a data center, which is why the sector, you know, for the last 15 years has had, you know, call it double digit growth. And this is a real estate business at the end of the day, right? So that's a pretty attractive dynamic for a, a real estate type of business. If you think about Google as a search engine, right? Because that's really what it is, right? It's an advertising platform that delivers search results, generate billions of dollars of revenue, right? It absolutely uses AI to generate those results to figure out what to present to people and all that stuff, right? Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. A lot has been written about the enormous and increasing costs of large language models, but one aspect to that story that's gone unreported is the impact it's having on data centers, the physical server farms where all of the computation takes place. This week, I speak to Raul Martinek, the CEO of Databank, one of the industry's leading data center providers, about the intricacies of data storage and the challenges of GPU-intensive workloads for AI. Raul's perspective illuminates the foundational layers of our digital world. Join us as we delve deep into the world of data centers and their pivotal role in shaping the future. But before we begin, let me mention our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. So remember these three numbers. 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system for streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. The number 25, because NetSuite turns 25 this year, that's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. You manage risk, get the most reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information you need in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible right now. Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance. Download it for free at netsuite.com slash ionai. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash ionai to get your KPI checklist. That's netsuite.com slash ionai, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Again, that's netsuite.com slash ionai. They support us, so let's support them. It's great to, uh, great to be here, Craig. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I'm uh, Raul Martinek. I'm the CEO of DataBank. I've been uh, in the internet infrastructure space for over 27 years, kind of since the advent of the commercial internet, you know, working with sponsors to build uh, the kind of the foundational businesses that uh, underpin the modern internet. When you think about your cell phone or your kind of your desktop and you think about the physical infrastructure that's required to move those bits to you, you know, it typically starts with on the wireless side, some type of cell tower or a small cell, as we call it you know, all hits uh, fiber optic cables, and then ultimately everything comes back to a data center, right? So those kind of three links in the chain are what we consider digital infrastructure. And DataBank is a U.S.-based uh, data center operator and developer. Uh, we, uh, we own and operate about 65 data centers in 26 U.S. markets, uh, giving us the largest geographic footprint of any data center operator, operator in the U.S. public or private. Uh, we're backed by a whole group of uh, investors, including Digital Bridge, which is a, 
a leading uh, infrastructure manager in this digital infrastructure space. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people with with the the migration to the cloud and all of the talk about the cloud, uh, I think a lot of people have forgotten that there are independent uh, data centers out there. Um, I mean, the, the the cloud is a network of data centers itself, uh, but that there are data centers outside of the big cloud providers that are not necessarily cloud data centers. Yeah. Yeah. And can you talk about how, and, the, and then of course there's on-premise uh, uh, data centers uh, that, that people use if they are very concerned about their uh, their uh, data security and that sort of thing. Uh, but can you talk about how the existing independent data center market has evolved Correct. as the cloud has taken over and then how that plays into what's happening with uh, with AI and generative AI in particular? So, uh, so look, just a, a quick little rewind, right? So if you think about it, about 15, 20 years ago, you know, you'd walk into any office in America and there'd be a data center. It was called the computer room, right? And what the you know the internet came along and really kind of made applications portable and data portable, so to speak, right? So that's what kind of created this kind of need for, as we call them, a multi-tenant or carrier neutral data centers, right? You know, so uh, in the in the mid two thousands is when people's mentality really switched and enterprise it said to themselves, hey, you know what? We don't want to build and operate our own data centers. It's like it's like an individual building and operating their own cops. So we're going to outsource that physical aspect to a third-party data center like a data bank, right? And that's where you look at some of the early companies in the space, uh, Equinix, Digital Realty, which are still the two public guys. That's kind of how they started, right? By by meeting the requirements of enterprises that wanted to outsource their data center requirements. In the, in the early 2010, you had the rise of public cloud, right? Uh, obviously, uh, at that time, there was a lot of different companies uh, competing for that, right? It was looked at as an alternative to on-prem or to third-party co-location. You have companies like Rackspace, and if you remember SoftLayer and Join and GoGrid, I was working for a cloud company called Voxel at the time. And ultimately, we were still kind of trying to tell customers, hey, this is a better way to manage your IT infrastructure. Well, you know, the industry kept growing because what happened is enterprises just kept outsourcing and there was so much kind of on-prem data center demand that it just kind of propelled the sector forward. I'll tell you, the mid-2010s, like, uh, 2012, 13, 14, you know, people would ask people like us, hey, how's the cloud going to impact your business, right? Because it was perceived that this way where it's either you're doing cloud or you're doing on-prem or third-party co-location. And fast forward to today, what's actually happened is that those are, those are different things. And ultimately, the cloud has been a huge accelerator of multi-tenant third-party data centers, right? And it's happened in a number of ways. Number one, enterprises have gotten more savvy about, you know, where they want to put their workloads. And it turns out that the cloud is really good for certain things, but for other types of workloads, especially what we call persistent workloads, it's not that great from a cost perspective. You don't get any of the benefit of that ability to burst up and burst down, right? So companies have become much more savvy about where they want to put their workloads. And that's this term that we use in IT. It's called a hybrid approach, right? Do some public cloud, do some private cloud, do some colo. But more importantly, what happened is that, you know, the public cloud companies themselves grew so much and so quickly that they couldn't even satisfy their own demand. And today, if you look at the big four, right, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Oracle, right, they probably outsource, because no one knows the exact number, but they outsource about 50% of their data center capacity and bill the other 50%. They just can't be everywhere. And even their balance sheets can't support the tens of billions of dollars required to build out all this infrastructure. And as importantly as that, you know, when everyone talks about the cloud, we like to think about it with those four players, right? Like it's some monolithic or oligopoly, right? The reality is, as I like to say, there's this long tail of cloud companies. And if you think about businesses like NVIDIA or Akamai or Pure Storage or PayPal, any company that is a technology company, a lot of these companies have said to themselves, we're going to build our technology 
inside co-located facility. And we're not going to build our own facility. So the reality is, is that what a data center ultimately does, it underpins the ability for companies, organizations, for society as a whole to deploy technology. And all that technology has to go into a data center, which is why the sector, you know, for the last 15 years has had, you know, call it double digit growth. And this is a real estate business at the end of the day, right? So that's a pretty attractive dynamic for a, a real estate type of business. And what's happened most recently is, you know, AI has appeared, right? That is now the latest kind of technology that is highly, highly dependent on data center capacity. And what we've seen, you know, over the last six months is just really an unprecedented amount of demand to deploy AI in these data centers. And you've taken an industry that already had some pretty good tailwinds as a function of public cloud growth, as a function of enterprise outsourcing, as a function of increased technology adoption across the board, now has this now this new vector of growth, which is AI adoption. And for people like us, it's obviously a really exciting yeah. And the AI and, and the cloud, they both kind of, from my understanding, grew up together. I, I, it's kind of chicken and egg. Uh, the, but the, what I've heard, I heard this from Michael Jordan, who's a very famous computer scientist, not the basketball player, uh, who, who, who uh, is uh, an Amazon scholar. So he has some insight into Amazon. I also heard it from Ilya Sutskover, who was one of the researchers on the original transformer uh, algorithm paper that the way Jordan put it is that Amazon was building these data centers uh, for the to carry the computational load of, of their logistics uh, calculations uh, which were AI based and they they eventually realized hey a lot of other people need this uh, we can make it available publicly, yeah. and that was AWS. And the way Ilya said it to me is that uh, the cloud existed, but there was really no uh, demand for it until uh, people started doing uh, AI, and then there there was a demand for for massive parallel uh, computing. Uh, so in the early days and that was gpu based so in the early days it was all cpu i imagine or mostly cpu when can you talk about the economics of of the gpu based data centers to handle uh these uh, uh the, the ai loads and particularly yeah. the yeah. ai and i'd like to, i love the comment a little bit about what you just said there about the ai in the, in the public cloud right if you think about it yeah i mean you know, there's some people that refer to the age that we were in as kind of the internet AI, right? If you think about Google as a search engine, right? Because that's really what it is, right? It's an advertising platform that delivers search results, generate billions of dollars of revenue, right? It absolutely uses AI to generate those results and to figure out what to present to people and all that stuff, right? You think about Meta, another big platform, right? They use AI, obviously, with their social algorithms, right, into a recommendation. Amazon's a little bit different, right? Amazon, at the end of the day, Amazon was a computing platform, right? We call it IaaS, Internet uh, Infrastructure as a Service, right? Amazon's proposition to enterprises is don't go buy your own servers and your own storage, just rent it from us because we can do it better, cheaper, faster. They really didn't need AI for that. What they really need was just great software engineers who knew how to deliver of this physical infrastructure like it was software, right? And then you had Oracle, which obviously with their database is a little different, right? But I think what, you know, so they were building out all their capacity to basically meet those business needs. And along comes ChatGPT, right? Which is a, a new form of AI, right? I would argue it's kind of like, it's a general purpose uh, AI. Maybe it's, so we're entering the business AI phase where that is a chat box, obviously, that's built on a large language model that gives out these eerily uh, human-like responses. And now people are envisioning all kinds of use cases to use that technology. You know, for example, Bloomberg just recently announced that they're building a large language model called Bloomberg GPT, which is 
not all Bloomberg's financial data and financial insight to be able to output, I assume, responses around financial decisions. How do you balance your portfolio and what's the risk reward and things like that. So so what's I, so what I, what we think is happening in the space today and, and data bank, you know, we have a kind of a unique uh, perch that we sit in, right? Because we operate these 65 data centers with 3000 customers and we get to see what equipment and what applications they're bringing into our data centers. I mean, they own all that equipment, but we get to work with them on that, right? So what we're seeing today to your question is that people are starting to say, okay, I want to deploy um, some type of large language model or generative AI in our data center. And that's going to require a new type of processing. It's no longer going to be CPU based. It's going to be based on GPUs. And obviously we all know from reading the press about NVIDIA and how they are now in, in kind of the, the, the crux of, of this massive movement because their platform is now the, the platform of, of uh, you know, the first platform that people want to use to develop these large language models. So, so those are new types of workloads. I like to say they're net new workload. It's something that has nothing to do with how the world operates today. Because again, every data center in the world today is, you know, somewhere between 70 and 100% utilized. And think about that, it's running the world today. So these are all new things that are coming into the data center because there's a new application that, is there's a use for it. Yeah. And those GPUs are much, much more expensive than CPUs. So how does that uh, impact the, uh, the ultimately the cost of inference uh, that that uh, end user is paying? I mean, all of these costs are built into that that end cost. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, there's there's a couple layers of costs that co that are that are pretty significant, right? As you just pointed out, the the boxes themselves are just more expensive. The networking is more expensive. This can't. This doesn't use Ethernet. This uses InfiniBand, which is a very high end networking technology that makes these clusters look like they're on the same wafer, it's the same sort of wafer, right? All that stuff is a lot more expensive. A rack of GPUs is a lot more expensive than a rack of CPU. Right. In addition to that, these clusters consume an inordinate amount more power. Right. A CPU rack may consume 5, 10, 15 kilowatts of power per rack. We're seeing GPU racks consume 10, 20, 50, up to 100 kilowatts per rack. So you're talking about maybe 10 times more power consumption just in that same data center space. Right. Ultimately, that all outputs to you know, these queries are very intensive, right? If you think about like how much data this model is holding in RAM and its ability to take a prompt and then spit out a highly intelligent answer, there's a lot of computations, go, you know, happening to just output that, you know, that simple sentence that is a prompt, right? So multiply that times millions and millions or tens of millions of prompts and you've got a significant amount of new data center capacity that will need to be deployed if businesses, you know, want to, you know, uh, uh, adopt this technology. And all indications are that, you know, people are doing this, right? We know Microsoft, uh, because of their public announcements, have, you know, uh, identified a number of products where they're going to weave chat GPT into their product set, one of them being a product called Copilot, which allows uh, Microsoft Office 365 users to basically have ChatGPT help them write Word documents and PowerPoints and Excel files and things like that. Uh, that's going to, again, that's going to require hundred in our estimation, hundreds of megawatts of incremental data center capacity. And that's just one application. Hmm. And that, uh, that pressure, that demand, presumably I haven't tracked GPU prices, but presumably that puts up upward pressure on GPU prices. And uh, so maybe you can talk about that, but also uh, in, in is there enough uh, power generation capacity to handle this growth of, as let's say in, in the United States? Well, you know, there's, there's probably enough available power. The question is, where is it available, right? Because, you know, Data centers are, as you said, they're, they're, they're a collection, right? And they need to be 
located in many cases in proximity to other data centers. So, well, look, our, our view is that, um, you know, in the short term, that the data center development timeline, we, we measure things in years, right? Because we're building these very, uh, you know, technologically uh, advanced buildings, uh, the parts that go into them, what we call the MEP, the lead times on that are 50 to 60 to 70 weeks, right? So you just don't pop up a data center like you pop up, you know, a, a, you know, a bar or something that, you know, you might be able to construct by, you know, doing the whole depot and, and putting stuff together, right? So, so, so our cycle is measured in years and you have this demand that has hit like a tsunami over the last six months. And, and, and we believe that, uh, no, there isn't enough. There isn't going to be enough uh, data center capacity uh, next year or the year after uh, to meet all the demand that we think is going to come from businesses wanting to adopt this generative AI technology and incorporating it into their, into their business. So, so yes, the GPUs, uh, you know, NVIDIA is, is doing a really, a really good job of trying to prevent uh, a secondary market in GPUs and creating like a stub hub uh, for GPUs where, you know, they go to the highest bidders because obviously that doesn't help, you know, them uh, maintain, uh, you know, a good, a good uh, supply chain. Uh, and on, and once you got GPUs though, you got to put them in a data center, right? These are not boxes that can sit in the house, can sit in an office, can sit in a warehouse. They need to go into a data center. They need to be powered. They need to be cooled. Uh, they need to be secured because they're very expensive and they need to be, you know, connected up to the global internet, right? So, so yeah, I think, Craig, that's going to be a really interesting dynamic uh, to, to, to see what happens over the next, you know, six to 12 to 18 months when, if this demand continues at the pace that we're seeing, but data center development just can't accelerate off a dive because it's more of a multi-year type of timeline. Yeah. Are there other GPU uh producers that are um that are filling in back filling where where nvidia uh, maybe can't meet demand and is there any question uh that nvidia is going to fall short of demand yeah uh two, two good questions i mean yeah there are look there are other players out there right there's uh obviously uh hp is uh is a big player they they bought cray supercomputing if you remember them so they have, uh, and they recently announced, I think it was last month, they announced their kind of own internal uh, machine learning uh, type of offering, right? Based on uh, some chips from Intel and some chips from, from the Cray that were more specialized. Uh, there's specialized companies like Graphcore. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a company called Cerebrus that's, that's built right. the largest chip that uh, has yet been built. And they claim is, you know, from uh, certain types of applications is more cost effective. Than GPUs. I mean, look, I think it's like any new technological wave, right? When the internet came out, right? It was like there were, uh, I, I don't, I think there was, there was Cisco routers and that was it, right? I mean, there, it was our wealth fleet, I think at the time, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, so what is that? Oh, what did all that demand do? It brought in more entrance, right? And it brought in more supply. Obviously we're talking about, you know, highly, highly advanced um, uh, ch uh, chips that again, not something that can be uh, started on the dime. Uh, but look, I think there's probably enough of an ecosystem where these other players are going to benefit, right, from this demand because probably uh, NVIDIA isn't going to be able to deliver uh, enough GPUs to satisfy the demand that is going to happen. So the people are going to turn somewhere rather than not do these projects because, you know, this is considered obviously a technology that can create massive uh, competitive differentiation. Yeah. And this is a bit of a dog leg on the conversation, but I'm interested in China. I've spent a lot of time in China uh, and China is uh, scrambling because of the sanctions uh, that prevent certain entities from buying uh, GPUs or advanced uh, semiconductors. How, how can China compete? How can it keep up with data center demand if it doesn't have access to uh, NVIDIA GPUs? That's a that's an excellent question. And in fact, there was a, a book written uh, called AI Superpowers, which kind of talked yeah, about- Yeah, Kai-Fu Lee, yeah. yeah I've, uh, the AI war between US and China. And I think, I mean, I think uh, that is a, I mean, 
I think the, uh, the previous administration and the current administration's efforts to kind of rank fence China away from advanced chips, number one, and then as you know, even advanced manufacturing like the AMSL uh, in Amsterdam, right? So, I mean, they're going to, you know, so obviously that what is China's reaction is to try to accelerate uh, their own super, uh, uh, it's their, super, their chip uh, semiconductor industry. Uh, they have, you know, uh, programs where they're investing tens of billions of dollars to try to do that. But I, I, I listen right now. I would say the U.S. is in, in the in the Western uh, powers are in a really good position if they want to press their advantage, right? Because there there really aren't any substitutes for the most advanced chips, which are really the ones that you kind of need to drive, or uh, you know, these 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 types of technologies. Yeah. Uh, on the on the cost side of, of your your filling new data centers with GPUs, has the price changed? I mean, and are you passing price increases on? Yeah, yeah, pricing is going up. I mean, look, you, you already had you had the beginnings of that last year because the data center space, because as I mentioned, we're we're basically technical real estate. Our pricing is based, broadly speaking, on two major things. One is our cost of capital, right? Mm -hmm. Two is construction cost. And last year, what we saw is because of inflation, because of interest rates, right? Because of supply chain, not only cost of capital went up, right? We used to be able to borrow at two and a half cents using securitized debt. Now we got to do it at 7%, right? Uh, so, so the cost of capital has gone up. And the cost of construction has gone up. So last year, you already started seeing an increase in costs that were being driven by inputs, right? But now you're seeing uh, even more dramatic increase in costs being driven by demand, right? That folks are, again, there's just so much demand. You know, we we have been pricing deals at 30 to 35% more in Q2 than we did in Q4 of last year, so six months ago. Uh, and we're getting 30 to 35 percent more per per kilowatt because of the input costs and because of the demand. Wow. Uh, it, it, yeah. And just to clarify, you're not buying GPUs. You're Correct. providing the the rack space for Correct. GPUs. Yeah. Correct. Uh, I, or do you also provide GPUs? We yeah. We do not. We do not. No, we're agnostic to you know what technology people deploy. That's one of the beauties that we like about our business model. Right. Uh, well, where do you think uh, the the power consumption is headed? And there's a lot of concern. I mean, there's certainly a lot of research being done on uh, making uh, these systems more efficient, making training more efficient. But uh, ultimately, there is a concern that as this works its way into the economy, I'm talking about generative AI, that uh, the percentage of, of national or global uh, power output uh, is uh, that's consumed by these data centers is going to grow. Have you guys looked at that analysis, or are we very far away from that being a real issue? Yeah, no, I, I think that is going to be an issue down the road. And look, it, this is this is good. We need to have a dialogue in this country about, you know, how we're going to, how we're going to face that, right? Because we're obviously not consuming power because we're just deciding to run, you know, innate things. We're doing it because other consumers say, Hey, we want this capacity, right? So I think there's a lot of questions about AI. I mean, look, the, the U S power grid, as you know, is going through just like power grids all over the world through a dramatic transformation around, you know, fossil fuel to renewable, Right. I mean, I'm, I'm based here in, in the state of Texas and, you know, the ERCOT uh, power system, which is the, the Texas power system, I mean, has been extremely progressive at delivering new generation. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that uh, people might be amazed that Texas is the number one state in the country for solar and renewable. Right. Because there's there's wide swaths of, of land in, in Texas. And then uh, the business climate is very, uh, very, um, you know, promoting that those types of investments right so so you know there are, there are and you know the the main utility here in Texas Encore is part of that uh, so there are utilities that are very progressive about okay working with data center operators to you know figure out how to bring more power to locations that make sense from a, a data center development perspective 
I mean, what I think is happening, you saw it in Ashburn in, in the Washington, D.C. area last year where Dominion Power ended up with, you know, in a shortage, right? And basically had to tell data center developers, we're not going to be able to deliver the power that we told you we thought we could. And what's that, what that has done is it's spawned, it's pushed that demand into other markets like Dallas, like Atlanta, like Chicago, like Phoenix, uh, like Reno, right? So it's moved them into other markets around the country. So so there's going to be a lot. I think what we'll see is that, you know, there's going to be new, as we call them, data center clusters that appear. Um, you know, Ashburn Market is the largest data center cluster in the world. It's probably got three gigawatts of installed data center capacity, right? The next biggest one would be like Dallas with, you know, five, 600. I think what ends up happening is you end up with much, many more regions in America where there's a gigawatt or a gigawatt and a half of data center capacity. And by spreading out that load across the entire country, you know, I think um, we'll do a, you know, we'll do a good job at, at meeting that demand. But, you know, ultimately it's hard to predict, right? I mean, we're in, we're in uh, the first six months, seven months of this phenomenon. And certainly, um, you know, these things tend to accelerate uh, and they certainly tend to play out over, you know, a multi-year period. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, what about internationally? I mean, is uh, are are you building data centers outside the U.S.? Uh, are there markets that, for example, in Europe that are becoming uh, like the, the the data center clusters for Europe? Yeah, yeah. So we're we're, we're more focused on the U.S. Uh, among our, our our different sister companies within Digital Bridge. There are companies that are building in, in South America. Scala Data Centers is building in, in South America. Atlas Edge in Europe. Vantage is building in Asia. We regularly dialogue with those companies, so we're aware of those trends. And absolutely, you know, there's a, a lot of data center development, probably on a percentage basis, actually more growth in those markets because they had started farther behind than the U.S. market, right? So. From an absolute numbers perspective, the U.S. is the largest market. It will continue to be the largest market. From a percentage growth perspective, South America, Europe, Asia, and now even like Middle East and in some parts of, of Africa, uh, specifically South Africa, are starting to see you know significant data center absorption. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is going to be a global phenomenon. I mean, you know the. Again, I, as, as, as I talked earlier, I, I really think it's purely about, you know, people consuming technology. And when you think about that trend and the fact that there's 8 billion humans on this planet, you know, most of them have a smartphone now. There's all these mobile networks, right? So people want to interact with technology. That interacting with technology, be it TikTok or be it threads or be it whatever, ends up driving data centers. Going to fall behind economically if they don't have adequate data center capacity, I mean, a fall behind the U.S. If indeed generative AI is uh, what's going to be driving uh, economies going forward, that's a really interesting proposition. And uh, look, I, I would say, you know, if you think about um, you know uh, Eastern economies, Asian economies, right? I mean, a lot of them I've been performing extremely well, of course, right? Um, China obviously has some uh, issues now, but they, you know, long, their long-term growth has been incredibly impressive. But yeah, you could see a scenario where if you don't have access to chips and then you don't have access to uh, you know, data center capacity because you have an inferior power, uh, power grid, right? And then other countries are developing very advanced forms of AI that, you know, as you know, Part of the fear of AI is that it will cannibalize or displace workers, right? What happens if that's the case with certain of these large language models and that starts to now impact workers in foreign countries and they don't have a method to, to participate in that? So I think there's a huge amount of open questions that uh, this uh, next technological revolution is going to, 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 uh, to pose. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of... Uh, da data center capacity. Do you have any metrics of, of for how uh, it's grown in the last six months and how you expect it to grow in the next five years, let's say? Well, 
So, and, and, you know, people, they, they usually come out once a year on that stuff. So at the end of last year, McKinsey came out with a study uh, that basically uh, said that, you know, U.S. data center capacity was going to triple uh, to like 17 gigawatts or I was like a global number, I believe, 17 gigawatts, uh, you know, o- over the next seven or eight years. Uh, you know, this AI thing is so new. No one has really, I think, put together a real uh, estimate. I, I did speak to one analyst that, uh, you know, that is really uh, well plugged into the space. Uh, they, they're doing some sizing. And their view is that, you know, from a base case perspective, AI should, at a minimum, increase data center demand by 30%. And it's entirely reasonable that it would double it, right? So instead of 17 gigawatts, we'd be going to 34 gigawatts. These are, these are, staggering figures yeah really wow uh so where are you guys building right now we are building in 14 uh 12 different markets right now uh you know we're building in a variety of like what we call tier one markets uh like ashburn like atlanta like dallas uh but we're also building in markets like san diego and seattle and minneapolis right i mean our view around uh ai is you know it's it's caught up in this uh, this other technological trend called the edge, right? Which is this kind of decentralization of the internet. We think that is also a trend that is occurring, uh, and that is going to become more prevalent uh, over the next ten years. And that's the reason we have this large geographic footprint is because we believe that customers will look to place really latency sensitive workloads in metropolitan areas to service the users in that metropolitan area. As opposed to today, where you kind of pick one or two spots in America and you're close enough to everyone, right? But ultimately, I think the quest for more real-time applications is going to necessitate that movement of infrastructure into, call it, the top 30 metropolitan areas in the U.S. Yeah. Um, the uh, on uh, Part of the power consumption you were talking about is is uh, for for these data centers is the cooling. What percentage of a data center power consumption is on the cooling side? And does does the technology, the coolant uh, cooling technology that you use, uh, vary depending on where you are geographically? Two two good questions. Yeah. So so the way that the way that gets measured is actually a specific measurement term for that. It's called PUE, uh, percentage utilization effectiveness, right? It really, it's, it's, it's a simple thing. We, we, we take two numbers. Let's say you build a data center and it's a 10 megawatt data center, right? And let's say you're delivering 10 megawatts of power to that IT equipment and it's consuming it. So that becomes the denominator. And then we say, hey, we look at our utility bill and say, hey, how many megawatts are we consuming? So if we're delivering 10 megawatts to IT equipment, but we're consuming, uh, you know, 10 or 13 megawatts. Well, it's 1.3 divided by one. So our PUE is 1.3, right? So that's the way we capture the extra energy that needs to go into a data center to keep the lights on, uh, no pun intended, and also mainly to cool the data center equipment, right? And absolutely, there's different technologies for that. Um, and it does vary by climate. I mean, um, you know, if you're in the northern, I mean, believe it or not, you, you know, a lot of te- this technologies uh, are advanced to the point where you can take advantage of what we call a free cooling, right? Where we can actually, um, uh, the, the chilling manufacturers have built systems that allow you when the temperature falls below a certain uh, temperature to be able to just run fans and use the outside air to cool the, 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 the liquid that then is circulating through the data center that cools cools the equipment, right? So, so we, you know, we like other players in the space deploy that type of technology, um, and it's really effective. Even in places like Dallas, you believe you believe it or not, it's obviously very hot during the summer, but in the winter it gets pretty cold. So there's a lot of hours of free cooling. Of course, there's more hours of free cooling than Minneapolis, right? Um, ultimately, all all te- like any technology, uh, there's different price points. You know, we. We, you know, there's ways to get that PUE all the way down to, you know, 1.1. Well, guess what, though? All of a sudden, if you do that, you've got to increase your price 
uh, by, you know, by 30% or 40%, then customers are like, no, we don't want that, right? So there's a balance between cost and efficiency. Uh, and obviously, as a data center operator, we're constantly looking at that balance and working with our customers and our vendors to try to figure out how to improve it. It's definitely improved over time. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, most data centers were had a PUE of two, right? So for 10 megawatts, they were consuming another 10 just to cool the building and all that. Now, um, almost all designs coming out of the gate have a design capacity of 1.2 or 1.3. So things have gotten really, really efficient and they'll continue to get efficient. Mm. Um, and you were saying that, uh, well, what what percentage of data center, center capacity right now is to run uh, AI or particularly generative AI systems? And I'm very small, right? Because it just started, right? So I think right. today, I think that number today again, there's so much data center capacity installed out there today, running the world as we know it, uh, and now this AI stuff shows up, uh, and I would I would probably say there's only a couple hundred megawatts of, of, of data center capacity that's been dedicated to AI today. Again, I think that number, you know, goes into the gigawatts over, you know, the next couple of years. Yeah. And in percentage terms of, of capacity, that would go from what to what? Yeah. That's another interesting thing. I, I you know, and that one, uh, you know, pick a number, right? I, I mean, I've seen some analyst reports that said that by 2030, 80% of workloads are going to be AI workloads. Uh, Craig, I don't know about you. I can't predict the future that well. But, uh, you know, so, well, look, I mean, if you think about the potential for that technology, right? If you think about the fact that, as I like to say, chat GPT, that's Windows 3.1. That's yeah. the greatest version of that technology you're ever going to encounter, right? That's frightening, right? I mean, it's exciting at the same time, right? So my point is, it, it's entirely possible that AI cannibalizes existing workloads because it just ends up doing it for it, right? But then it's gonna. But then what you're gonna do is just ship computing power over here to the AI workload, which would be a reason, or I should say, a, a scenario that would say yes, in the future you're gonna have, uh, you know, a huge amount of workloads that are AI workloads. Yeah, uh, and you were saying that currently the big for cloud providers offload a certain amount of their capacity to uh, independent data center operators. What, what what percentage did you say that was? It, it, I'd say a good number on average is about 50%. 50% of their data center capacity, they, they procure through relationships with companies like data. Yeah. And are they... Are they continuing to, I mean, I know they are, but is that, are they going to continue to build capacity themselves or? Yeah. They will do both. They will do both. It's just a, it's just a way to scale. I mean, an analogy, one analogy I like to use is like, I think about, a, think about someone like Chase Manhattan back, right? They own their skyscraper in Manhattan. They own probably mortgaging, servicing buildings that house tens of thousands of employees. But does Chase Manhattan build their branch offices? Yeah. They just lease that, right? I mean, so there's a lot, because they have a lot of different needs from very large needs to very small needs. And it just doesn't really make sense for them to try to do it all themselves. It's just more efficient uh, to be able to outsource that and 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 kind of you know leverage uh, the capacity, the balance sheet, the capability of, of that ecosystem. Yeah. Wow, well, this is this has been fascinating. Um, is is there anything I haven't asked about how AI is impacting data centers, or the cost of operating data centers is impacting uh, the inference cost of generative AI? I mean, that's really what I find most interesting. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, no, you've asked a lot of great questions, and I, I just think there's a lot of questions we don't even know what to ask because. We really haven't entered the production phase yet, right? I mean, for the most part, what we're seeing is that a lot of this AI is is still training, right? It's people that are building, like Bloomberg, are build, are going to build a large language model, are going to train it, and then they're going to deploy it, right? And then that's when I think the business model starts to take hold, right? Because presumably, 
after you start deploying it, then you understand kind of, you know, what's the revenue potential, what's the profit potential of that software, right? I mean, I, I liken this AI to almost like SaaS when SaaS came out, right? Remember when that word came out? It was kind of a strange word. No one knew exactly what it meant, right? It's like software as a service, right? We used to buy licensed software. Well, that's right. We used to buy a license and you kind of owned it, right? And now you went to a monthly recurring model, right? So, and, and think about how many SaaS companies have been created over the last 10 years, just almost a, you know, an innumerable amount of companies. I think AI takes that same uh, route, right? That ultimately, a lot of people will figure out how to apply that to just a huge number of different use cases, and then they'll develop an economic model on that. And I would also imagine that, you know, they're you know, this is again the first version of this technology. They're going to be people are going to be working around how to make this more efficient uh, with inference, so that it doesn't have to use so much power and so much compute. And that might be another way where the industry will will you know kind of help uh, scale itself. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Raúl for his time. If you want to read a transcript of this conversation, you can find one on our website. That's eye-on.ai. I also want to encourage you to visit netsuite.com slash ionai for an unprecedented offer by the number one cloud financial system. You can download a custom KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance. It's absolutely free at netsuite.com slash ionai. That's netsuite.com slash e-y-e-o-n-a-i all run together. So go to netsuite.com slash ionai to get your own KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash ionai. E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. I hope you'll support them because they're supporting me. And remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world. So pay attention. <laughs>